Welcome to a new episode of Outside the Panels with your host, Johnny the Machine Hughes. Welcome everyone to an episode of Outside the Panels. I'm your host, Johnny the Machine Hughes, and you know I love a good indie creator as much as the next person. And this time around, I've not had to go too far afield. No time zones to worry about this time. Oh no, we are firmly UK. Well, kind of. We're going north of the border to meet David Taylor. David, how's it going? It's really good, thank you. And actually, given um, all the stuff in the news, Scotland's trying to get rid of the rest of the UK and leave it, so quite timely as well. All right, all right, so that's the end of the show, guys. So thanks for sticking around. See you later. Bye. <laughs> Well, well, timely the news. Uh, hasn't hasn't someone resigned today? That's you know, that's the rumor. That's what it seems to be what's going on. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Lo- lots of chat about Scotland as part of the UK. It's, um, but I kind of like being part of the UK, so I'm fine with that. Um, I'm sure there's pros and cons to to each each argument. To be fair, absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. The the pro being that I don't have to show my passport to go up to my day job's head office, which is in Stirling. So that's always good. Oh yeah, I'm totally, I'm totally with you. It's uh, the ability to go down, like go places, like to London. Lots of stuff to buy in London. Lots of stuff yeah. to do in London. Kind of be be a bit awkward if I had to like go and take the passport to get down there. So this works out well. <laughs> indeed, indeed. So enough politicking and shebangs of that sort of thing. We're here to talk about fun stuff. We're here to talk about comic books. So David, tell everybody about yourself. You know, comic book creator. How yep. long you've been? How long you've been working in comic books? So I've been making comics for about seven years now. Um, My first book came out around about five, six years ago. And basically, I I loved comics since I was a kid and went to art school, did all the things, and I just kind of lost my way with it. Um, There was other things going on in life. There was music, there was girls, all the traditional stuff that goes on. And then (laughs) then I got a bit, then I kind of got a bit older and I was like sitting thinking, if I don't do it, I'm never going to get it done. Um, So I started working on what became Decades, which was my my first book. and I, you know, it was, it was like one of these things. It took me two years to get it finished, and I knew once it was done, I suddenly had all these other ideas start popping in my head, mm-hmm. and I just, I just love doing it. Um, so decades was completely self released, paid for it myself. Then I was working on another book, um, and thought, you know what, I'm going to try and go to Kickstarter, see if I can build a fan base and kind of meet people, and really just the best thing about comics when you, especially as an indie creator, is you get fans that are really, mm. really passionate for your work, and Kickstarter really allowed me to do that. And that's basically from the, the moment that I funded, it's been nonstop. I've just cool. kept working. I love working in crime fiction, particularly. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the genre I'm most passionate about. I work mostly in black and white, up until my most recent book, Wild Nature, where I decided to like mix everything up, not only do colour, but move into a different genre. Mm-hmm. Still with a little bit of the crime, bit of the noir stuff that I like being in there. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's just been going strong. Um, been meeting lots of new fans, got to conventions over the last couple of years. So yeah i love it i love comics i love storytelling it's the it's the perfect medium for me i think perfect excellent so you're a comic book fan of yours so what was what were the comic books that got young david hot under the collar by all the way back then <laughs> you know when i was a kid and obviously like a lot of like people from britain you know the beano and those things like that mm. um more in the, the kind of kids humor side of things yeah. and then it was there was the eagle um, oh, which, you know, oh! There's a name I haven't heard that yeah. for ages. That yeah. is just the the revised version. Yeah, it was the it was that kind of rebooted one that came out in the eighties. Yeah, um, Fleet, the 90s. It was Fleetway, wasn't it? Fleetway. It was. Yeah, it was yeah. Fleetway. And um, I remember like because like Dan Dare was the thing, and I liked a lot of the data. I loved the art, but mm. there was um there was a comic called The Thirteenth Floor, um, which was I think it was a John Wagner Alan Grant one. Okay. And I always forget the name of the artist. It's sitting in a box behind me somewhere. And um, <laughs> I remember like reading it, like being totally, I had to keep reading it mm-hmm. over and over again. Just the idea mm-hmm. was so great and it was so cool. And then just after that, I started looking for more stuff. And I think there was like reprints, some of the early Punishers came to the UK. Mm. And yeah, I loved yeah. that. But the thing that really kind of, the thing that I really loved was, um, was and like a lot of people I suspect, was Frank Miller's Daredevil stuff. Right. Um, okay. so the, Miller, the Miller Jansen stuff. And you can see it in a lot of my work that still carries through. Mm. And I was I was just in love, basically, from that point on. I loved the, the kind of blockiness of it. I loved the big emotions and I loved the drama and all the things about kind of cinema storytelling were in there too. Mm. And later on, 
there was like Sin City. They were probably one of the, there's a couple of really, really big influences. One is um, American Flag by Howard Chaykin. Okay. Um, That's absolutely. a controversial one to call out. <laughs> and, you know, it's, I mean, it's, it's what it is. You know, it's what it is. Yeah. And I, I loved it. I, I think it's less problematic than some of his work has gotten. Mm. Um, it's a much more balanced piece, I think. Um, mm. So I, 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 I really totally understand if I look at his work now and be like, I don't know if I'm so comfortable reading that. Fair enough. Yeah. I get it. Um, I don't read a lot of his more modern stuff. Mm. But I think but I think Flag is like a genuinely brilliant satire of a lot of what was going on in world politics and things like that. But the other one, which is probably less controversial, was Darwin Cook's um, adaptations of the Parker books. All right, um, okay. Like the Hunter, so I've got somewhere behind me. Um, <laughs> the, the giant, the giant size versions of them. I just love Darwin Cook. He is yeah. my ideal artist. If I could draw like anybody, I'd draw like him. Um, and I remember reading them, and I was like maybe thirty or something when the first of those came out. And like my brain just exploded reading it. Yeah. And it was that was a big part of why I was like, I need to make comics. I need to I need yeah. to finally do this. So yeah, Ooh. um I, I run a, a big gamut of a lot of things, but anything that gets me back to the crime genre usually ticks the box. I remember <clears throat> getting into a conversation recently about Frank Miller and what was his best mm. work. And I kind of I, I stick my cape on uh, year one. I mm. think year one is the best <laughs> Batman story. Yep. everything in there everything everything you need to know about batman is in year one yeah and, and someone yeah, was agree. someone's going about yeah but the dark knight rises i'm like i'm oh, sorry dark knight returns i'm like yeah dark knight returns is good but if you read it now it doesn't have the same it, it, it's it's more satire now than yeah it is back in the day you're like wow this is really heavy hitting you read it now it's like oh yeah, yeah, yeah look at that <laughs> You got TV stars as a president. As a president. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That'll never happen. Oh, yeah. Will it, Trump? Will it? Will it? Will it? You're fired. All right. Yeah. So, you yeah. know what I'm saying? It doesn't. Yeah. And I think since it is a good chance. When, mm. As soon as you've said that, and I've looked at some of your work, we're going to get a look into that later on. Sure. Yeah, I can see. I can see that. Yeah. yeah. The whole black and, I, and white thing. Yeah. Um, if, I, if I move my head just there, you can see I've got the artist edition. Ooh, check yeah. you out. I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure out which way my head should go. There we go. That Yay! Way. There you go. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. No, I love, I mean, I, you know, again, Miller sadly has become increasingly problematic as well. So um, um, that makes it. Yeah, I, that's, a, that's a fair shout. I think his problem started on Robocop too, but that's. <laughs> yeah, I think I think a bit of the old white, a bit of the old white powder started being his problem. Well, I wouldn't um, like to this. I yeah, wouldn't like to say but... anything. And if he's, Frank Miller's lawyers are watching, <laughs> I didn't say it. Just saying. No, right. no, and I'm, um, I'm just assuming. But yeah, yeah. I think you know a, a lot of that stuff. I think it's it's hard. I mean, he's got such a a, a back catalogue. Like to pick mm. one thing, I think. I could like I won't go into because I could talk about it for a very long time, but I think if you were like trying to get the pinnacle of like Miller as a cartoonist, mm -hmm. Sin City or A Dame to Kill For is probably it. Love um, A Dame to Kill For. Yeah, yeah. His art, his art was absolutely you know pristine. It looked beautiful. It was really clear what he was doing. Mm. His storytelling is still excellent, even at this stage in his career. But then it was particularly good because very um very very um very compressed storytelling. And it kind of flows really fluently and it's just it's just a really nice storytelling overall it's a really good book um but yeah i think your one is probably that or born again or probably his absolute best mm. um i don't think he ever wrote better than those books mm. um but yeah i think i mean what a, what a privilege like as an artist that you can have like 20 25 years one you know the absolute hottest very mm. little of your work was bad and you know what okay he's, he's declined quite badly but hey you know i don't think about him for that stuff i think about him for the no, stuff I, I think I think, and I've got his um, his Dark Knight three. I've got mm. the Dark Knight three. I bought it when it came out. The Master's Race, and I don't think it. I don't think it. Art wise, I don't think it matches what he's done previously. Um, no. It's a. He's kind of evolved or devolved, depending on your opinion. Um, I think he got mis mis um, mis advertised because everyone like Dark Knight, so it's a Batman book. It's not. Mm. You read it. It's not Batman. It's Justice League. It's just yeah. Like, to be fair, you know, so it's it just tagged on DK, so people get, get into it. Yeah, no, cool. But yeah, Frank Miller's good shout. Good, good shout. So, yeah. did you stay away from superheroes other than Frank Miller, or um, was there... no? I mean, I, I mean, I've still got a fair chunk of sitting in my bookshelf. I've got quite yeah. a lot of stuff. I think I just I got to. I, I liked a lot of that stuff growing up, and yeah. I think you know some really some obviously some of the absolute best books you know are, are from you know dc and marvel and mm. i think going through the 80s so much of that work was so interesting but i got to a point where 
it just didn't speak to me the same way. Um, and I, you know, I'm always careful because I don't want anybody thinking I, I look down on superheroes. I don't. No, I totally no. get what they are. But like, I was more interested in indie stuff. I was more interested in the weirder things that were going on. The turtles. Um, the turtles were around in the late. Yeah. Yeah, 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 you know. Mid eighties. I mean, I mean we're yeah. talking. When I talk to. I'm talking like Eastman and Laird. I'm not talking yeah, about the, the cartoon show. You know, we're yeah, we're talking about those black and white things. Yeah. Yeah, and the thing is, I was I was studying up in Aberdeen, and we had a local comic shop called Asylum, uh -huh. and um, and the guy that owned it, Mike, he was like so good at recommending stuff because I just said to him, mm. like, I don't know if I'm really enjoying reading this stuff anymore. Mm. I was like, what would you say? And so that was part of like you know I discovered American Flag. Mm. Um, there was things like. I'll forget the names, and I, would, I don't want to keep turning around to go and find the books. Yeah, right. um, I've got some like really, really cool um, things like Bright by Michael Bendis's torso. Um, I know he wasn't a big name at that point, but he obviously became a really big name. Oh yeah, um, obviously like a classic like Mouse and things mm. like that. As I started finding that stuff was more appealing, mm. and I like the diversity of it. I like that you found lots of creators from lots of different backgrounds, mm -hmm. and they brought really interesting stories into like into mm. play. There's a really good book called Incognito. Um, they did a sequel to it a few years ago, which was about um, back in that kind of era of segregation in the US. Mm -hmm. And it was a journalist who could pass as white, um, hence Incognito. And, mm -hmm. um, and he sort of infiltrated the Ku Klux Klan. And it's right. this comic, like, the stuff like found that, I was like, well, I wanna read that stuff. I wanna find yeah. weird things that make mm. my brain work. Um, so yeah, no, I, I still like it. I'll pick stuff up occasionally. I think the last mm. thing I really did was, um, was it was it Immortal Hulk, the one that Al Ewing wrote? Yeah, um, yeah. Which yeah. which I thought which I thought was brilliant. Unfortunately, yeah. also problematic artist. Um, so, but the but the art fits the book, right? Because it's like supposed it to be a horror book, and you know it's kind of yeah. has that 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 horror vibe in there. It kind of just totally skews your your your, yeah. your normal superhero aesthetic, I suppose. But, yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then there's been like other stuff like. Um, Joel Jones' run on Catwoman, I thought was absolutely brilliant. Really, that's an interesting yeah. shout. What did did you like the writing, or did um, you like her art early on? Because I love Joel Jones. I think mm -hmm. her Lady Killers for Dark Horse was mm -hmm. absolutely, probably hands down one of the best books of that year. I have to say mm -hmm. that because my blurb advertising it's on the graphic <laughs> novel. So, <laughs> but no. Yeah. And then when I heard she was taking over. Catwoman, I was like, "Whoa, this is going to be great." Mm. I, I, I don't, I, it just didn't, it just, just didn't gel for me as much as yeah. her Wonder Woman, her, her Wonder Girl, Yara, mm. fantastic again. So, I yeah, don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe it's just the, the way I came to. It. I didn't go in with any great expectation. I was yeah. enjoying it, just kind of enjoying it for what it was for me. Mm. Um, and you know, I think, I think her, I, I would agree. I think Lady Killer is a much better book, though. Um, a million and times I, better. Uh, Ten times. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. It's absolutely fabulous. And that was, I think it was her first, one of her first books. It was like, you yeah. She, because she worked with um, yeah. James. Oh, is it Jones? Yeah. James? Martin? No, James. James. It, James I, do you know what? James. I, James. He's the editor. He's current editor on, on the Batman books. There yeah. Yeah. And there it's like, yeah. I got, he signed, he signed my copy of You Have Killed Me. Yeah, um, cool. I, I thought Bubble a couple of years back, so that was pretty cool. Um, yeah. yeah, but I know what you mean. Yeah, so yeah, no, I, I love that stuff. I, I I thought it was fine. I, I like Joel actually. I like her stuff. I like I say, I like her nowhere. Um, and then you know Becky Glunan is another one. Mm -hmm. I think Becky's work's absolutely brilliant. Again, talking like a nowhere. Um, but again, pre I prefer their independent stuff. To yeah, their, their comic work, I think yeah. their, their superhero work. But that's just because I like the stuff that's personal, and I like I like that coming across, and it's why. Yeah. I'm always happy when I see like a brilliant creator in one of those books go and do their own thing. Yeah. Because then like Alice Coat, um, who's like a fabulous writer, made mm -hmm. his name doing a lot of stuff for Marvel, and then he went and made Zero, yeah. which is just barmy but beautiful and wonderful and like one of the <laughs> things that has touched me the most as a reader. And, cool. so, and you wouldn't get Zero without him doing that work. Yep. So I'm grateful for it. Yeah. So it's kind of, I, and I say this quite a lot, the Marvel DC books, are great you get the instant fan recognition straight away across yep. the major icons but you are playing in someone else's ball pit so for someone like joelle jones who can push the boundaries on lady killers for yep. example sooner or later she knows that the editor is going to turn around and say well you know what you now need to press the reset button and selena's <laughs> back in gotham and you're like god damn it you yeah. know so that kind of happens but then the flip of it is in indie books you get to do what the hell you like because yep. your creators 
but you don't get that major appeal, that cross major appeal, yeah. unless you're really, really lucky. Um, yep. So, and actually, you know, and what you said there about you hit the reset button, I think that's one of the other reasons I don't really follow superhero books. Yeah, it's just because, getting cyclic. It, it, well, yeah, it's not getting, it, it has, it's been cyclic for yeah. years. You know? Yeah, and the goal is just to reset back to the status quo yeah. every single time. And I think it's not that I mind the investing in it. If the story's really cool, whatever, I, I don't mind that stuff. Yeah. But I think when I look at that, I want things to be, I want to feel like they've got permanence, that they've got some impact mm. on the world. Yeah. And I think the instant you've got like 60 odd years of continuity to deal with, you just can't do that because yeah. they're, they're, they've literally they've done so much that those characters could not have done that in their lifetimes. Mm. So mm. it stretches the boundaries for me of like, where's the, I, where's the drama? Well, I think, I think part, of the, part of that particular problem is that you and I are both of an age where we've been reading comics for so long. Yep. Right. Yeah. Comics are supposed to be a five year thing. They're supposed to get you from from being like eight or nine to getting to like thirteen, fourteen, where you're supposed to put down the comic books and start hanging out with girls and music like you did. Yeah, that's yep. how the, that's yep. what's supposed to happen. So in that five year snapshot of a window, yeah, yeah. all that all that stuff can happen. But it's when you True. hang around like we do and we think, oh, hold on a second, hmm, <laughs> Batman's back being broken again. Really, I remember the first time that happened. <laughs> that's just that's just careless, Batman. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying. So, you know, part of the part of the problem I think is that um, superhero comics is that they are dealing with an aging readership because kids aren't getting into the comic books as much as they, they used yep. to. You know, yeah, yeah. I go into um, the local comic book shop near me called the Dal Knight in Darlington, and mm. uh, kids come in and say, "Oh, have you got any old comics?" And there's like boxes of back issues yeah. and the guy goes well how old do you want well you know the last five years i'm like <laughs> you're kidding me that's well that's that's deep, that's a new 52 that can't be that old you know like, there's me dare carrying, you? How dare yeah, you? <laughs> there's me walking around with a copy of you know miss marvel 16 from 1977 or whatever yeah, yeah, <laughs> right you know about you know about them let's get to you let's have a look boom here we go so this is decades this is your yep. first book um, yep Love that cover massively. I think it's very atmospheric. Um, trees are quite scary. They're kind yes. of like trees stroke tendrils. Yeah, I, you was know, that, I love. Was that an obvious thing, or did you kind of? Um, there was a big yeah. I would, so that I wanted the whole kind of thing with the forest in the story to be, but it's a very like forests actually are for real at nighttime. They're just terrifying, mm. and I like the idea that they're they're almost like knife slashes themselves. Yes. Um, is a very aggressive thing, and you know, the whole, you're right. There are tenors. It's the idea without ruining anything in the story. Oh yeah, it's yeah the yeah. idea that, that things grow out of your roots that you know end up destroying you in different ways, or the mm. guilt, you know, dark urges to do horrible things. Mm. You know, so that was kind of in there. But I was really proud of that cover because um, really I think it really it captured a lot of what was going on with the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you can see that. So go on. No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm amazed. This is your first book, right? So this is. Back back in 2017, I know it's getting yep. um, getting polished, shall we say? Um, yeah. <laughs> and I mean, this looks as fresh as it could be like yesterday. You know, the, I think I love the heaviness of the kind of you know the the black inks you've got going on there. The, the heaviness shows. Yes, there's shadows in there, which I think is fantastic. How you managed to show the gradients in the black and white comics of shadow, mm. I think it's a massive achievement. Oh, thank and, you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it was a, I had a, I was a, maybe a, knowing me, so I'm going to babble a little bit. Um, no, go for but, it. It's all about you, a, David. It's all about you, sir. Yeah. <laughs> it's nice. It's nice for someone to say that, Johnny. It's nice. Um, but yeah, you know, when I, when I started off, I didn't really have any plan for the story. I, I knew I had a couple of ideas I wanted to do something with. Uh -huh. And I was like, and I had this idea for like one scene in particular, and mm -hmm. I didn't really have any idea how to get there. And so I just started working and drawing stuff and like drawing pages. I ended up redoing a whole chunk of it. Mm -hmm. um but one thing i did have that was this idea this real mood of it mm -hmm. and that it was very much actually those kind of 80s indie comics things like james obar's the crew but Ooh, not with lovely. that level of not yeah. with that level of craft because obar you know his level of tone work is absolutely stunning um you know but that was that i wanted to have that heaviness to it yeah um oh, so well. that just kind of that just kind of bled into everything i was like and when i, I remastered it last year because it, it, it turned five Mm -hmm. And I wanted a print copy, so I was like, you know what, I'm going to redo it. I'm going to do something mm -hmm. with it, freshen up a little bit. And so there's some new pages. I redrew that. That's completely new page in the story. Um, 
but I kind of went back to like looking at that and I was still really happy with the atmosphere of it mm. um, and like how I was able for considering what I felt I was quite limited at the time um mm. and how I was approaching art but I, I was able to do all these things I was like do you know what this still holds up quite well um Very so well. I'm really glad you thought that but I wanted that dread I wanted that sense of mm. doom that's constantly happening in the story and yeah so it, the heavy blacks were a really important part of getting to that yeah. So we we talked about obviously Frank Miller and his his mm. art. Uh, I think someone who also uses a lot of shadows and blacks, someone like Mike Vignola, mm -hmm. uh, um, influenced. Not influenced. Oh god, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love. There's a there's a Hellboy print sitting on my wall over there. Um, All right, yeah. cool. Oh, I I love I love Mignola. Um, I mean Hellboy. I was I wasn't too much older than when I discovered Sin City. When right. I finally, I'd always been put off by Hellboy because I didn't get the whole kind of. I thought, they were, like, like he says, actually, in his, one of his intros, like they look like goggles, the little horn things. Yeah, yeah. And I just didn't, I didn't get what the book was. No. And then I just gave it a chance, you know, being the big open hearted soul that I was. And I was just <laughs> in love. I was in love with it. I loved the art. But yeah, I love, I love how he captures like such a sense of place with so little. Um, mm. And I still aspire to do that, to have that kind of atmosphere he can conjure. But yeah, definitely. You know how you were saying about uh, creators who kind of open up the world to, of comic books? Mm. um obviously go back to back to 89 and mm. everyone's batman mad right the mm -hmm. one book that absolutely i think stood out that year was gotham by gaslight yeah oh yeah stunning book yeah uh, and from that point on i was hooked not mm. as much as batman yeah i love batman but mm. things like mike mignola i'm like okay mm. so now i'm buying the dracula run from tops now i'm now i'm buying all sorts of other stuff because it's got his art on it you know and yeah I think, whoa you know and you know, I've I've reviewed so many of his books. He's turned into a writer as well as an artist, same as yourself. Which do mm. you find easier? Do you do you see them as two separate um elements or do you find because you're in the, the, the guy in the seat for both of them to, to kind of merge together? Um I'm a better writer than I am an artist. Um that's so, okay. um, I, I definitely think I'm, I'm more comfortable with writing. I, I, I can work faster and I can work through ideas a lot quicker. Okay. Um, I'm not a natural cartoonist or anything. You know, I've, I've worked really hard and I've gotten better and I'm, I'm quite happy where I am. Uh -huh. um, but I always want to improve. But writing, writing's part of my day job as well. So I'm really comfortable writing. Oh, yeah. um, cool. So that's the thing. But in terms of how I write, um, I've got kind of like, I don't want to make people might a lot of people might know this, some people won't know about the Marvel method. Yeah. Um, so that's a lot of how I actually write. Um, I, I do suppose that works. Outlines. That works for you because you're the artist. Yeah, yeah. So I do a lot of outlining and I figure roughly out what I want to happen. I write dialogue, uh -huh. and then I just kind of go at it on the page, mm -hmm. and I try and figure out how will this go, how will this go. So I can, and then I rewrite an awful lot once I've got things on the page. So I'll, I'll write the dialogue roughly in pencil, yeah. and I'll, I'll kind of I'll figure things out that way. So the kind of the, the art bones connect to the writing bone, to be honest. But okay, cool. But, but cool. writing. But my writing is where I'm happiest. I think that's what I find easiest to do. Cool. Um, from that book, we have a next up is a book that's not readily available. Is that right? Um, you can still buy the digital version of it. Oh, excellent. But cool. You, you can get the print version. Um, Let's have a look I'm out, I'm out of copies. <laughs> so, All right, fair enough. Yeah. I'm sent I'm sensing another Kickstarter coming. <laughs> eventually. Eventually. Yeah. We're a while off. <laughs> All right, excellent. So we have this beauty of a book. Everybody loves a femme fatale, yeah. correct? Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, and, and her started off. It was a it was an Instagram experiment. Okay. Um, so I, I was like sitting. I, I love those kind of old daily comic strips and like kind of Dick Tracy's and you know I, that was kind of in my mind. And okay. I thought I hadn't seen much on Instagram that used that format. Mm -hmm. And like the swiping is perfect for it. So I just kind of came with this little funny idea of what was like quite a straightforward crime story on the face of it mm -hmm. of obsession and you know and kind of that really noir atmosphere and then it turned into this kind of feminist um story about challenging mm -hmm. really how we're sort of conditions in crime fiction to to love and admire really damaged horrible men yeah. that do awful things and they do it for the damsel in distress so they do it mm -hmm. because it's the right thing to do and i just became quite interested i was writing it of how can you start off with someone who's stalking a woman effectively yeah. and make it really obvious from the start that that's what's going on mm. and how far can you push it before you reveal that he really isn't the good guy at all? Yeah. 
Um, and it was quite, a lot of people liked it when I, when I was doing the book we'll probably talk about in a little bit, was a book I was doing and I kind of released that, this is part of it as a print edition. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing the amount of people that came back to me really specifically about the story. They just loved how it was, it was different to other things out there. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, it was great fun working on it. I got to work with a lot of language that I wouldn't normally, I was playing with like things like EC crime comics. I used the same sort of font. Oh, I love that. Um, yeah. And it was like, so I was, I was just going to town and, you know, homaging all sorts of stuff. The main, the main guy character, Paul, was based on Paul Newman. And um, he's one of my favorite actors, but I love the idea of portraying this really kind of quite clean cut icon mm -hmm. as being a bit demented. Um, mm. And then, yeah, so I just kind of had fun with that. And it was like, could I draw lots of cool, beautiful looking panels and, and make them work as a story? Yeah, so it was great fun. And um, it was, I was practicing some things I wanted to do later, which was like tone mm -hmm. work. So yeah, so that was her. I'm really, I'm really enjoying this. I think I could read, I'm going to, I'm going to read that later because I'm, 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 <laughs> I'm reading it and I'm hearing like a, a, a lonely, slow trumpet playing in my ears. Yeah, you know, the type oh, of, absolutely. Yeah, that absolutely. type of feeling going on through that. I, that that is perfect. Excellent. Oh, again, another well worth book. It's hard to show. I think if you're used to kind of um, the, I don't want to say male dominated, but if you've got stories that have feature a lot of male characters in there, and then you mm. switch it up and you introduce a female character. The, the, the aesthetic's different, you know, the yep. dialogue mentions that she's the light in, in the darkness, you know, and I like how you've gone for um, not over the top womanly elements. Yeah, you can sure. see she, she, you can see she's a, she's a woman, you can see she's got legs, you, you know, she's got a <laughs> body, you know, and I think it works brilliantly in that, in that framework massively. Yeah, I think it's, it was really, it was really important for me that if you're going to do something that's even adjacent to feminist, and it's not a heavy feminist text, no, no. it's too short for that. Um, it's not, there wasn't that much depth in it. Mm. But if you're going to do that sort of story, you cannot sexualize the woman overtly because yeah. that kind of defeats the whole purpose of what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a good fun thing to work on. It let me learn some new skills and figure mm. out some new stuff. And yeah, I'm, still, I'm really proud of it as a story. It, it's interesting because you kind of it's a very tight line that you have to walk you've got to make the woman attractive so that the reader buys into why the character likes her yeah and why other yeah. people like her down the line perhaps and but then you don't want to sexualize her to, to, to the point where she becomes a caricature of the thing that you're trying to write about yeah so, absolutely i think yeah. things like you know that 90s comic barb wire is a really good example of it of a... i don't know what you mean barb wire <laughs> never heard of it <laughs> Never, Never heard, heard of such it. Yeah, of course I've heard of it. Yeah, but it's a, it's a good example of that trope going horribly wrong. Yeah. Of like, well, she's empowered, but she's mostly naked. And you're like, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. don't be wrong, 13 year old David thought it was amazing. <laughs> so, I, well, I got to be honest, I, if anybody who knows me or listens to my podcast knows that I have a thing about fishnets, blame the Black Canary, blame Zatanna, <laughs> it's fine. I don't care. <laughs> but there are times, you know, and I get. I get the argument. It's like, oh, well, Barb Wire, she's, she's empowered because she chooses to dress like that. She's dressing for herself. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But, you know, next time, last time I looked at a Justice League comic with Canary and she was stood in the middle of the Arctic with a parka on zipped up here, still a fishnet on. I was like, oh my God, what, what, what's going on? What's going on? Um, Powerful so, fishnets. That's all I'm saying. So. Yeah, it works. Hey, it's just fine. I'm, it's a fashion choice. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason why the camera's only this high. All right. <laughs> On that note, time for a break from one of our other shows. Um, if you are of a certain age and you like comics from yesteryear, this show's all for you. It's the old timers. If you want to find out what makes a professor do his happy dance, check out the All Timers Comic Book Show only on the UCPN. There you go, All Timers, for all you old school comic book fans. Check out the recent episode, which is a Valentine's special love triangle. Mm, some interesting ones on that one, but we'll see how it goes. Um, cool. Right, back to more modern day pressings. Um, so you've got crime noir mm. down. Yeah. You've got the firm fatale down. Seems to me that next up has to be horror, right? Right? Is that is that mm. the grave? Would you say the grave's horror? 
it's no, it's it's definitely crime war. It's crime war as well. Not. Oh, yeah. see, with a title yeah. called Grave, you would have thought, you know, I know. Steve's a I know. dodgy I was, ship there. I was, I was I was playing against type. That's the mistake oh. I keep making. All right, um, fine. There is there is horror coming. There is horror. I'm working on a horror story at the moment. Excellent. But yeah, the the grave was um the grave was something that had been in my mind for like years. Just the title and this kind of character that's got this massive scar down his face, and um. Yeah, and I, I just I was I was desperate to get back into. It. I was a huge fan of like films like No Country for Old Men. Yeah. It was kind of the years following like John Wick coming out as well. And I just had this idea of this this kind of deep this deep South hard boiled yeah. desert noir. Um, and I loved all the things like you know all the ain'ts and the kind of tough talking, real mm. fisty cuffs shootouts. I was like, yeah. I'm just gonna do it. I'm gonna do yeah. that. So that was that was my second full length book. And let's have a look again. Love the cover. Love the, I yeah. love the love the blue sky. Um, here we go. We ran out of blue, apparently. Yeah. So this is um, <laughs> this is uh, this is a cover. It was the first time I ever approached like a professional artist to go and do something for me. And this okay. is by Alex Ogle, who's done like a ton of Marvel covers. Okay, Absolutely cool. amazing artist. And I just messaged him on Instagram. He was so kind, mm -hmm. and he did this, and it was like beautiful, beautiful book, beautiful cover for it. So, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it was. It started off as a, as almost all my books kind of start. They start off one thing. They always end up becoming something else. Mm -hmm. And it was going to be like a, a fairly short, pulpy action story. And instead, it became a big rumination on what happens to us when we feel when we've been traumatized by something, uh -huh. um, and when we've been damaged by things that have happened to us, and the way we then end up putting damage back onto other people. Um, yeah. But with lots of kind of tough, ball, tough talking, almost western type vibes. Yeah um yeah and that's i mean you can see it's like you know it's big it's cinematic yeah and lots big of lots panels. of guns classic cars yeah, yeah. cool i are you tempted because your art style whilst i mean this i'm looking at this one and, and whilst it's still dark and heavy it's nowhere near as heavy as the first book decades you can see you can see the pencils are becoming a little, uh, a little bit more refined and you mm. and you maybe using angles better to kind of tell you your story are you ever tempted the because the overall style is very similar mm -hmm. to kind of have a recurring characters or character sign kind of guest in aspects of these across the board so they kind of have some yeah yeah there is I mean, I mean De so the decky's her and the grave they're all set in, in different eras basically yeah um well her her and decky's are kind of more or less modern day um mm -hmm. the grave's set in the 1980s um so I have thought about it. I'm always kind of wary of like, what what am I serving by doing that? Yeah. Um, I've got. I mean, I've got some ideas. There's. I've got a few things I might go back to. There's a there's a, a crime story that I'm thinking about, which might be set in the same town that, that the grave's set in. Mm -hmm. Um, but probably about. I like the idea of playing with that, and I like you know there can be mm -hmm. things in there. But for me, once I'm kind of done with the characters, I'm really done with them. You oh, know, okay. I've spent that time with them, and I've explored the thing I want to explore, and then I'm going to yeah. move on. Um. But no it's tempting for you then. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, maybe, maybe. It's like yeah. you know, it's like you know, I, I like sequels as well. I think if you've got something you can really say with a character, yeah, then absolutely. But I think like like decades. I've, I've got an idea for decades for a prequel for decades. It wouldn't suit a sequel. But yeah, I keep asking myself like, do I really want to dedicate like a year of my life to working on something? Am I going to say something significantly different for it that's mm. going to make me feel different? And also, like, I can go and do something new and something weird and then, like, go through that exploration process, which is, like, mm. much more fun. Um, but, you know, you never know. I, I change my mind all the time. If you asked me three years ago, was I ever going to do anything but crime books? I'd be like, no, that's all I'm going to do. And that's, <laughs> you know, that's not how that's worked out at all. So, you know, don't it, trust I, me. Is my point. Don't <laughs> trust me. <laughs> that bodes well. <laughs> um, what was I, say? I suppose it's kind of like um comfy shoes right if you go back and revisit the places you've already been it's like oh it's nice and comfy it's warm it's not a challenge whereas if you go back and think to yourself well hold on i want to move forward or you know one of the books i read recently i say recently over the last two years great dogs by tony fleece mm -hmm. uh, and it's by image comics if you get a chance to read it horror cute i don't know if you've read it it is fantastic but a second series comes out of only two issues and it's not a sequel it's a prequel kind mm. of explain how the dogs got to the place where we see them in the main uh -huh. book and that's it it's done mm -hmm. you know? and 
that's equally as heartbreaking as stray dogs in the first place, you know. Um, so there is, I suppose, you're absolutely right. If there are parts, there are stories that you can't take any further forward. I wish the people who did John Wick would realise this because the first <laughs> one was really, really good. The second one is loud, and the third one is like, dude, why am I even watching this? But that's really, that's well, maybe just my personal choice. I, I think you know, and I think that's fair. I mean, the first John Wick's like a genuinely brilliant film. The other it's two massively. are great. The other two are great fun, mm. but they're not. They don't have the same weight to them because they're not about the thing that John Wick's about. Yeah. Um, and they're also they're some like the action is maybe better, like moment for moment, it's better done. But the first John Wick is like. Some of the story, it's like a bullet just coming straight at you. Agreed. For like when you're two hours at that, and it's why it's so great. But what you were saying there, but you know, you get prequels that kind of they're their own complete thing. Yeah. And they tell you, they, they give you some other insight, or they change things for you. But for me, I see that, and I agree that there's some stuff that I've watched or read that's been exactly that, and I've loved it. Yeah. But for me, there's, there's so many other stories I could tell. Yeah. There's so many things I could do. There's so many like, and I I don't want to spend. But we'll talk about well nature at some point you know in this conversation but that's been three years of my life i've been working on it mm -hmm. and the last thing i want to do is do a sequel to that yeah because i'm like there's other things i can do doesn't mean i won't maybe come back to it there might be some stuff actually there's a few things for that book that i've got in mind as well but <laughs> but that's the thing you know i i like to go where my it sounds this is going to sound so incredibly obnoxious no, I, like it's not. Muse, I, I like to go where my muse takes me <laughs> it's like, and I okay. just it. it's like, yeah. like no, that was obnoxious actually yeah no <laughs> so so later on when we get off air he'll say david will say to me can you cut that out i'm like yeah no that's not that's scary and sorry and, dude. So <laughs> <laughs> we're going to jump a book because uh i am concerned about time and we really yeah, want sure. to get to um to wild nature um let's have it it's just around the corner where's that where have I put it? Um, let me just make sure. You know what? I'll go with that one first. We'll do this one. I like I like the cover on this one massively. Um, that one I want. Might as well do it numerically. Go for it. Boom. Uh, yes. That's, that looks like any video that I rented back in the 80s. <laughs> yeah, from a from a garage that you pay your pound fifty, you take your chance. If it's halfway round, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. That was like the warning sign, wasn't it? Yeah, you yeah. must rewind the tapes. All right, okay, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> it was either that. Or, it was either that or it had subtitles. That was the other reason I got returned to my local one. Yeah, it was like, I remember going in there like what, like years like when DVD was the thing. And they yeah. got themselves a world cinema section. And I remember Ooh. going in and I picked up I think with Battle Royale. Um, and like and the woman behind the counter said to me, You do know it's got subtitles, right? And I was like, <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, I don't mind. She went, Some people, oh, they get very angry at the subtitles. <laughs> <laughs> so, fair enough. So it might have been that as well. Anyway, sorry, yeah. I digress. Yeah, it's no, no, it, 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 it screams brilliant. Again, yeah. your art evolved and get you can see some similarities. I mean, this guy here, um, I'm assuming he potentially blonde but yeah. again the square jaw is very similar to the kind of characters we've seen in the past this guy is a true evolution from from decades you can see how that style has kind of shaped and gone from there i have to say the masks are quite scary yes but thanks yeah. for that yeah anytime um, happy to share. <laughs> um, it's a, i have to share my own nightmares and put yeah. them back out into the world um <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, and well, I mean, well, nature was like it was a it was a proper evolution for me as a creator. Mm -hmm. um, the the story was a much simpler, pulpier kind of thing. It was really actually quite dumb. Basically, the original idea it was just going to be an excuse for people to punch each other for seventy two pages, and I decided I was going to work with an editor. Mm -hmm. um, and so Claire uh, Claire Napier, who's my editor, um, I sent I sent over the outline, and she came back with this um, the most gentle piece of thing, of damning praise. Um, and she just basically said, it's okay. And I was like, oh. Uh, <laughs> I think it, was, it wasn't okay. It was really boring. Yeah, it was yeah. just, there, was, there was just nothing to it. And like basically mm. she just said, how about you do this? And um, and I basically then spent like a week writing up about the world that everything happened in. Mm. And then writing about the characters. No story, just the characters. Mm -hmm. And it was, the, it was the best experience I've ever had as a creator. Mm. It was so much fun because I started playing all things like, there's this death sport called Wild Nature and all the combatants were animal masks. 
Um, mm -hmm. And the greatest of all time is the dude that's wearing the swan mask. He's called Swan Spoiler. Um, and Swan, Swan's trying to retire, but the sport's not right to let him go. Um, yeah. And on one hand, the story's about him trying to move on from a life of violence. Everyone else is trying to suck him back in. But then there's also this relationship, this woman called Alice, who blames him for the death of her brother. Um, so it was like, what started off as this really silly, pulpy action thing mm -hmm. has become this really big rumination on identity and family as well as and you know, this comes back a lot i'm really interested in in toxic masculinity and male self-loathing and like all the men in this really dislike themselves mm -hmm. and they express it violently mm -hmm. um and that was like it was so it just became this thing from something very simple to this incredibly for at least from from my perspective really complex work with mm -hmm. lots of badass action and people wearing animal masks <laughs> so i'm ticking all the boxes i can yeah don't ever let anybody laugh at my fishnets anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, with the as, with the nature of the writing, you know, <laughs> we talked about male um, male self toxicity. I guess, yeah. You know, I mean, it's a subject that comes up quite frequently, but nobody ever addresses that. You know, there is a level of pressure put on blokes to look a certain way just as we are on women we've got to have the six pack you know my wife's banging on about wanting to go and see magic mike like can i dance like that that's not going to happen anytime <laughs> soon um fishnets or no fishnets so i mean i, I want to see it though i want to see it, it happen what <laughs> so, me dancing or, or magic mike hey interpret that however you like yeah so. thanks <laughs> if i see it if i see a long-haired dude wearing glasses dancing in one of your comic books in the future I want the copyright. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I suppose the big question, the big elephant in the room, because yeah. it's such quite a heavy, heavy topic to talk about, even when you kind of sprinkle in the action to maybe lighten the tone or lighten the mood, which seems oxymoronic to say that when we put it that way. But yeah. is the idea of that kind of self-loathing is that is that something that that you've witnessed or something you've dealt with that kind of reverberates to to make you drive to right to sort of open up that kind of worms yeah i mean i i, I went through a long period like in my in my kind of 30s I, I really struggled with basically dealing with emotions and being emotional mm. and opening up to people and i kind of i got to a stage where i realized i was i was just numb to everything all the time mm -hmm. um and like what you would just call depression in most other kind of languages but i didn't recognize it as that mm. And then a, a bunch of stuff kind of happened that knocked me out of that complacency. And I was, you know, I started feeling lots of things and I, I didn't yeah. really know how to process them. And what I kind of realized was that in my effort to appear bulletproof to everyone uh -huh. was that I ended up pushing people away from me because I was like, well, what's the point? I'm not getting a response from you. I'm not getting any sense of like vulnerability. Yeah. And so I brought a lot of that into it. Not, 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 not intentionally at first it, it started coming out yeah in what i was writing and I, I just suddenly found it was a really interesting thing to explore because mm -hmm. of, so there's a big influence on wild nature is the movie the running man um mm -hmm. and it's watch like a movie yeah yeah okay. so it's basically imagine a cross between the hunger games the running man but with like some deep self-help therapy going on in this at the same time oh, um, cool. and the idea was that I, I really like that film it's silly it's trashy yeah, yeah. but what interested me was like underneath all the stuff that's going on, there's a whole like world of that film that's not explored. Mm. And it's that first of all, the stalkers, I think, you know, there's stories about them. I, I'd want to read a book about each of them. Mm -hmm. And then for Arnie, like the, the thing I don't like in the film as much as I like him generally, is that he's just this lunk who's always right and always on top. Yeah. And I was like, and you know what? It's just not interesting. And I thought, well, yeah. how about if I had Arnie, but instead of Arnie it's Denzel Washington, Right. And instead of Denzel Washington in, like, even in training day to an extent, but maybe it's Denzel Washington in The Manchurian Candidate, where he's really quite damaged. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, and yeah, all yeah. those things you're taught about service and, you know, strength and, and honor are actually not true. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of what I started playing with was like, well, what, what's this idea? How far can I go with that? Mm. And how can I show, you know, all those relationships with people that they're all self perpetuating mm -hmm. kind of this negativity for each other? Well, and I thought, yeah. at the same time, as heavy as it is, it's also quite a funny book because there's lots of interplay with other characters. There's a there's kind of quite broad satire about how sport and violence are being increasingly commoditized. Yeah. But, you know, even there's like kind of 
piss takes about excuse my language uh, you can cut that out if you need um but there's stuff there's a there's a whole thing it's called make miami magic and right, this was okay. a coming off the back of like trump's halfway through his term the, the pandemic begins oh yeah and i had this idea like if you're rebuilding miami which has basically been devastated by a pandemic which seemed very likely for a while yeah. um and what would happen well you'd have these kind of like corporate interests starting up rebuilding programs yeah and like so that was a kind of fun idea as well i got to play with was like how cynical the whole thing becomes mm -hmm. so there's lots of really dry humor um the characters have lots of kind of fun interplay it's not super it's not dour all the time to use mm -hmm. a very scottish word um and and I, dour as i would say yeah. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> which is probably the right way to say it but i'm scottish and therefore don't speak properly um I, but, you said that i didn't you know i'm just I i'm it. just saying I it. yeah, yeah. yeah so there, it was all there was all that sort of stuff that i kind of wanted to play with and then there's all the action stuff as well so i wanted it to be really satisfying on every level you would want to read it Mm -hmm. um and if you come for the big character stuff it's there for you if you want the bold action it's there for you if you want the slightly kind of 2000 ad sense of humor that's there as well mm. so it's, i think uh, it's, it's there i think i think you've hit the nail on the head for a lot of people that you know the fact that if you're of a certain generation it's hard for blokes to open up and and talk about what's going on emotionally um you know for <laughs> Of a certain, if you're a certain age, you know you're taught boys don't cry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. And, and that's like, I'm not saying that's beat into you, but it's certainly drummed in here. Um, and then as we grow up, and then as we mature, and then we get these things, this light, these life events put upon us. All yeah. we hear is that that voice in our head saying, "Boys don't cry, boys don't cry." Yeah. And then that generates that level of emotional apathy i guess and then as you mentioned something happens and it cracks through that shell and then you realize you know what it's all right to get upset it's all right to feel yeah. angry to feel hurt to feel yeah you know? so absolutely. i think that's a really strong message that, that that you put out there i think that's really massive um yeah. and it needs to be said more more blokes uh should be able to feel comfortable to say you know what i'm not okay there are yeah. things that yeah I mean, yeah. and, and without without spoiling, like you know, because yeah, don't I'm spoil working, anything. Go buy yeah. the book. Yeah. Buy the book. <laughs> because I'm, I'm I'm working on the final part of it, um, right. which will you know we coming out hopefully fairly soon. So yeah, that was Wild Nature two, which came out last year. Yep. Cool. And then and then Wild Nature three is coming out in well, it'll be this year. It'll be this year. I'm working on it right now. Um, but like one of the things is like you know the journey that Swan goes on is is exactly that is getting to the point of being able to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So this is not a spoiler. This is like quite obvious what's going on. Mm -hmm. And then, you know is that you can you can take faith and connection in people from mm -hmm. you know from any anywhere you meet them and you can let them in and it can mm -hmm. make your life better by doing so. Um, yeah, so it's like you know I've I've kept going with it. I've tried to kind of really spend time in that character place and cool. enjoy spending time. I, I love writing all the characters in it. They're there are people I'm going to really miss when I stop writing them. Um, <laughs> when, my, when Miami gets blown up again. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. What, what, yeah, what exactly. was the choice? What was the choice to go color? Just as this is an interesting point because this is this is full color as opposed to your yeah. previous work, which is black and white. Why, why the change up? I it was one of these things again. I was thinking, will it, if I don't do it now, will I ever do it? Um, mm. And also, it was particularly for this story. It's so it's so indebted to that kind of miami kind of 80s vibe mm -hmm. um there was lots of video there's a video game called hotline miami that was a big influence in my head with it um yeah. miami vice and then actually the the comic series miami vice redux that jim Mathew did the art on i've seen that that's yeah that is bonkers that is bonkers, bonkers. And, um, <laughs> yeah so I, I was looking at things like that and i thought you know what i, I want to do it i want to learn how to do it i've never really worked in color mm -hmm. and so it was like there's a good challenge to doing it but it would make the book really stand out and it was it allowed me to do so much more tonally because mm -hmm. you can have these moments like the deep blue the you know that yellow really pops <coughs> yep but it let me when you there's flashbacks throughout the book and i so use color coding yeah and the color coding allowed me to do lots of real mood stuff that i couldn't do in black and white to the same extent and it just made it it was a fun tool to play with and i did i started doing really weird things you know that the image you've got in the background to this conversation well, you know is you know i would never have tried doing something as weird looking as that with like you know purples and blues yeah. and there's bright greens further down the image and it's like those i just books, i've enjoyed that expression those books will fall on his head <coughs> excuse me if he's lying in bed he doesn't want those books falling on his head put the heavy books yeah. at the bottom dude absolutely the check, yeah. 
Yeah, made a mistake. I mean, yeah, it's just it's why, would you, why would you build a room like that? Just why oh. would you do it? So. <coughs> Excuse me. It's all right. Um, no, it's interesting. The camera angles work really well again. You know, you can see how things have have evolved from the from your first book. You still have that really strong character again. I mean, look at this bottom panel. You know, that's thin lines on on the back of the head there, rather than you know the big heavy lines from the first book we looked at. Yeah, must be... they they do get chunkier as this book goes on. Well, um, I, I imagine a... so. That's probably where the action comes from in the the, the, there's a, the standout there's a... element. Well, yeah, and and what there was also a thing that I started um, I started challenging myself about my inking. I mm -hmm. got in this habit of drawing everything. I was being like really fussy about my inks, so well, I was like yeah. over penciling. I was over inking, and I, I I I'm still really happy with the art, so I'm I'm not mm. in any way criticizing myself over it. But I just felt sometimes you start seeing it come in here. It was feeling a bit static to me at times. Mm. So I started looking at Darwin Cook. I started looking at Alex Toth and guys like that, and I thought, you know what? They were like really bold with their lines. They mm -hmm. gave it a go. And if it didn't work, it was fine. You could, and it's digital how it works. So I can delete it always after. Anyway, if I get it wrong. But so I just suddenly started doing that. And with the lines getting chunkier, it got more expressive. Mm -hmm. And I just loved it. I loved it from that point on. And so there was like another big shift in how the book looked because of that. Um, yeah. And the, and the action gets much bolder. And I started doing really weird things with the lettering as well. Yeah. Um, which was fun. <clears throat> it was just really good fun. I think lettering is one of the things that I, that's my hill at the moment. I hate it when letters don't get cover credits. It bugs me. Yeah. It bugs, bugs me to, to high heaven. Yeah. And, and, and the, re the way I solved that was I just don't work with anybody else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <so>. <laughs> Take over Ted. Take over Ted. Yeah. But I do, I do credit all, I credit every collaboration on the cover yes. every single time. If you are interested in any of the books that we've looked at, you can follow um, and check out. Uh, David's website. Let me just bring that up. It is um, what do I want? This one. Boom. So it is there you go. Um, David F. Taylor dot art. There you go. All the books we've talked about <clears throat> including the great picture that I nabbed for our background today are there. Check that out. All that information. There's a store gallery. <gasps> get free comics. Yes. Always, always click the get free comics. <laughs> All right. So always get that. And if you're in, there is the website there. There you go. Yeah. Dead simple to find. Excellent. Um, there is also a mailing list. Now, you're coming back to Kickstarter down the line, right? Is that correct? Yep. It should be around about May time for Wild Nature 3, which finishes the whole story. Okay, cool. So, if you're interested and you see the fantastic work that we've seen, you, the book's massively important. The, the, the great, the look great, the immersive is the word I'd probably use um, to go from that. Then you can sign up for a mailing list. Um, there is elements to this, which, uh, boom, that one. And if you sign up to the mailing list, check out. You can get Wild Nature Volume 1 for free. For free. For free. And, and you, yes. also get, you also get the first part of The Grave, and I think the first chapter of Decades as well. Whoa. So you get, you get a preview of most of my work um so yeah it's a it's a really good way if you want to get a taster without over investing and it means you'll find out when the books come when one nature 3 is going to hit kickstarter which should be around bit mate and of course remember those kickstarters get there early when it's a launch page click to notify me so that you get in there you know first 72 hours get those uh, pledges in you know you can see how fantastic the books all the books have been you can see the evolution of the art the storytelling techniques all of it is there, you know. And for all you UK listeners and viewers, <clears throat> how often do I say how great it is to have a PDF for international uh, readers? Well, this is our, these are our readers. These are our creators. So support them. You know, not everything has to be uh, from overseas. Not that this is our overseas collaborators, of course. But step, you know. <laughs> support your locals that's what i'm saying yeah that's why i go to two different comic book shops yeah yeah excellent. 
<laughs> Honestly, it's a nightmare. I see a book come out. I'm like, do I get that from you or do I get that from the other place? Which book? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Um, there you go. There's the link to the uh, mailing list. You can pause this and make me look stupid mid-speech. It's fine. Go and write it down. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, um, and of course, we've already seen the link there to check out the art. Okay, from that web page, you'll be able to find all the others as well. Dead yeah. simple, dead easy to find. David, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been great you, talking. Yeah, you, you are you are an absolute gem. You can come back on the show anytime, sir. Absolutely, absolutely. Always can always talk comics and we can always talk about the comics we disagree with as well. It's like, oh, it's the most we... fun. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> oh, no, on that note. All right. Okay. So don't forget to check out the new CPN for all your favorite shows. Uh, we've been talking about big two. So I have to talk about no price podcast for all you Marvel fans, which includes the MCU. And of course, Disney plus, uh, if you're interested in DC, check out the definitive crusade and don't forget to troll back through all the other outside the panels where you get information about kickstarters uh the interviews with some big name creators some great big kickstarter collaborations coming up you know where else can you find it but only on the ucpn david thank you so much for your time i really do appreciate it thanks johnny you're more than welcome i have been your host johnny machine hughes and as always adios Visit UndercoverCapes.com for the latest and greatest podcasts via the Undercover Capes Podcast Network. Also visit our parent company website, ComicCrusaders.com, all about comic pop culture. <laughs>